Here's the big one, though. It, it gets called the conspiracy theory. So people say, well, look, this whole thing is a scam. They all made it up. It would say something like this. They lied about the resurrection. They faked it. How did they fake it? Well, they stole the body. They took possession of the body so that they could fabricate the empty tomb. And then they go around preaching this lie that Jesus rose from the dead. Well, see, this explains some things now. It explains that Jesus did die, and then it explains how the tomb was empty. The explanation is the disciples stole the body somehow. Um, And then it explains why the disciples are going about saying they saw Jesus. The the answer it gives is they're, they're lying. It's a conspiracy. Okay, but again, let's think about it. First century Jews, I've already told you, really did not have a concept of a Messiah who would be defeated, die on a cross by his enemies, but then rise again from the dead. They really didn't have a theology that lent itself to that. The reason I share that is it doesn't make sense that they would have made up a story like this because a story like this was not in their minds. But there's a few more points to make that that make a little more sense. Um, I've already shared with you the, the resurrection about the end of the world. I jumped ahead here. Let's think about something logically. Do you think the disciples could have overpowered those guards and stole the body? I don't. The record we have in Scripture is they're, they're cowards. They're worried about their own lives. They've just killed their leader. Now they, they think they're next. You have Peter denying Jesus to a little servant girl. And the Scriptures record that the women are out trying to honor his body while they're behind locked doors and hiding. I don't get this picture, therefore, that they're plotting a heist. On top of that, why did the Jews have to pay the guards off to lie about how the tomb was empty? See, the conspiracy theory works against itself. It's not that the disciples stole the body. It's that why did the Jews have to pay off the guards to lie about they stole the body? Because they knew they had a problem to deal with. They have an empty tomb, and they don't know how to explain it. So there's a few more problems here. What gain would the disciples have had from making up this story? If you make something up, it's typically because you have an angle. Do you get? Do you, I mean, do you think that's true? I mean, typically, if you're going to lie about something, you're you have an angle you're pushing. You're trying to get something from me, or, or get you you have an angle. So my question would be to this theory: What's their angle? What do they get out of this? Does anyone know? I mean, what? What mostly was the end of the story for the disciples? Did they flourish with prosperity and wealth beyond their wildest imaginations, uh, go to speaking tours and get book deals for their account of the resurrection? What happened to most of them? If they weren't killed, they were exiled. We have on record John was probably exiled, but they either were physically killed or they physically lost just about everything, property and possession. So they all went to their deaths or exile for preaching this story. They got no wealth or social fame or status for this story. All they got was hardship in life, were hunted down, thrown in jail, beaten, and killed for perpetuating this story that would have been a lie. Again, I stress, what's the angle? They got nothing for their lie, so why would you lie? But let's go a little further. Let's say that the story is fake, it's made up. Well, what's funny about that is this would actually be a terrible way to make up a story for their day. And here's why. Women are sort of the heroes of their story. If you remember the gospel stories, it was the women disciples on the third day who first discovered the empty tomb, right? It was the women who were out in public going to honor the body of Jesus with the spices, The disciples were cowardly hiding behind locked doors in fear for their life. So if they fake the story, it's funny to me then that they make themselves the losers and the women are the heroes. And in fact, that would be not anything of how they would have done it in their day. You would not have made women the hero of your myth. In their day, women did not have a lot of legal rights. Uh, Women's suffrage and movements was not a thing in their day. Um, a woman's testimony for their day was not even acceptable in a court of law. 
A woman could have witnessed a murder, and she could be the only witness to that murder. She cannot testify in court because she's a woman. Her testimony has no legal credibility just because of the fact that they're a woman. Uh, so women, again, it doesn't make any sense that the wom- women are the heroes who are the first witnesses to the empty tomb. You would have read their story and said, man, you're crazy. I'm not going to believe your story when these women are the first ones to have seen the tomb. We all know women are, they're women. They don't have any rights. So why would you make that up? That's a terrible way to advance your, your story. So again, it's highly unlikely if you're making up a story, you're not going to portray your leaders as the cowards and the low class of society as the heroes. Now, hear me clearly, okay? You may say, well, no, wait a minute, that happens all the time. Yes, it happens in our day, okay? I mean, you got underdog stories all the time, right? I'm, I want to remind you, though, I'm talking about for their day. If you're going to make up a story in the first century, you're not going to make up a legend where women are out front and leading the way. You're not going to do that. Today, sure, that happens. We, we've, we're a different society, a different world, but not them. That's not what you would do. You would also probably not put people by name where it would be easy to go to that person and ask them, is this true? And they could easily say, no, that's not true. I don't know why they're saying that about me. Joseph of Arimathea. He was a high-profile public official. Okay, if it wasn't legit, why would you put him in there when all you'd have to do is go to Joseph of Arimathea and say, hey, what did this happen? Well, again, you could say, well, maybe he was in on it. Maybe, but again, I stress they have everything to lose if this is a lie because most of them did lose everything. Uh, Nicodemus too, right? He's another one they mentioned him. Well, someone could say back, uh, one of my professors said this back to me, and it troubled me at first. I had to think about it. He said, well, but people die for lies all the time. That doesn't prove anything. Because my argument back was, uh, why would the disciples willingly die for what they know was a lie? So if the story is made up, why would they go to their deaths? And they said, well, but people do that all the time. People die for false stories. They do. That's true. A big example I like to use is a radical suicide bomber. A, A radical suicide bomber has been convinced if you will go kill these people and in the process kill yourself by strapping the bomb to your your chest here, then their religion, I'm not an expert in that religion, but uh, the way I understand it, it sort of guarantees them a 100% sure way to paradise. Um, Because in Islamic religion, I understand enough to know it's a very works-based system. It's not faith in like we have Jesus it's what we think of sort of how the Pharisees were. You have to keep a code, keep commandments, dietary laws. So I knew Muslims in college, and I asked them this, and they verified that, well, yes, we, we hope, they'd say things that like, we hope will make it to paradise, we believe will make it to paradise, because they're trying to do enough of this stuff. Now, that's probably overly simplistic. If a Muslim were here, they might tell me, here's why you're wrong. I get that. But that's the gist of it, Okay. But the radical forms of Islam, I want to be clear to say, you know, not all Islamic people are suicide bombers, but the radical forms of it teach those people, if you'll go blow yourself up and kill the infidels in the process, that locks your way into paradise. Like that's the best you can do and Allah will receive you in. My point I'm saying all that is this, that person has been convinced of a lie. They've been convinced that if you'll do this, this is what will happen to you. So he is, by definition, dying for a lie. And that kind of bothered me a little bit. But then I thought, but wait a minute. What's the difference in the story of a radical suicide bomber dying for what he thinks is true but it's not and the disciples? People can be fooled into believing a lie. You could, the suicide bomber has been, I would say, tricked. He's been duped. He's been fooled. He's been led to believe a certain way, and he now acts on it. Okay, so, but there's a big difference in that and what I'm saying the disciples did. The disciples did not say they were told Jesus rose from the dead. What did they claim? We saw. There's a big difference in, I'm telling you what I saw. I saw the man after I also saw him die. There's a big difference in that and me convincing you, hey, Jesus rose from the dead. 
and you take my word for it. I've convinced you of something. They're in a different category. They're not like the suicide bomber who's been convinced of a lie. They're actually claiming they saw him with their own eyes. So the suicide bomber, for example, let's say somehow he could be proven and someone says, hey, look, this is all bogus, okay? Like you could go um, kill yourself and none of that stuff's going to happen that we told you about paradise. Let's say he still says, no, I'm, I'm good with it. I'm going for it. Well, you'd say, okay, well, he's severely mentally unstable or something because he's been told this is not true and yet goes for it anyways. That's sort of the way I want you to think about the disciples. If they knew this was a lie, they're like that suicide bomber still choosing to blow himself up when he knows he gets nothing out of it except he blew himself up. Why would he do that? That's Unless you're just terribly mentally unstable and crazy, you're not going to do that. I'm making the same case for the disciples. If they knew it was a lie, if they knew that they made it up, if they knew it was a scam and they're perpetuating this lie, why do they willingly go to their deaths? They got no money for it. They didn't get book deals. Their kids didn't get free college or benefits or anything like that. So what did they get out of it? They had a life of suffering. Again, it goes back to then to say it's more logical that they meant what they said. They saw him after death. They saw him alive, and they knew they saw him to the point that they said, I'll willingly let you kill me because if I were to tell you I didn't see him, I would be lying. They were willing to die for what they knew were true. Again, you don't typically die willingly for what you know is a lie. That's the big difference. You can die for something you've been convinced of that's not true, but you're not likely to die for something that you already know in advance this is not true. That's what's at stake when we think about the disciples. Here's a final point I want to make. There's something else we have to reckon with. Uh, one of my professors, he didn't like, he didn't agree with me on this. That's fine. But for me, when I was told this, sort of a light went on of, whoa, like that to me actually is a big proof for Christianity, for the resurrection specifically. And it's the fact of how do you explain the explosive growth of Christianity in the first century? It's actually somewhat of a proof for the truth of the resurrection to consider how it can be that the first Christian community just exploded into more growth and more growth. When you read the book of Acts, we can't overlook that, that fact. How can it be explained that such a claim, as wild as the resurrection of a miracle-working teacher who rose from the dead, caught on to so many people in so many places so fast? You could say, well, but people believe lies all the time. Hold that thought, because there, there's a little bit more to this. It is interesting that much of the public, this is the point I, I want you to try to get, when you read the book of Acts, and we're going to look at Acts in just a minute, when you look at the book of Acts, read it start to finish, I would challenge you sometime with this in mind. Watch for phrases that would give you clues that these people that they're preaching to, they're already aware of two things. They're aware that Jesus was crucified, and they're aware that the tomb was empty. If you reread Acts, I promise you you'll see it, and I'll give you some examples. Why does that help our case? Again, it proves the point that these people in their day, they know what has happened in Jerusalem. Word had gotten out everywhere that a man named Jesus was killed and his tomb was found empty. We don't know what happened to the body. Then all of a sudden, some apostles come along and start preaching to you, well, we know what happened. He rose again from the dead. And then on occasion, you find them doing a miracle to validate the message. And then what does the Bible say? Like they'll preach, do a miracle, 5,000 people are saved. And here's another story, and 4,000 people are saved. It just spreads like wildfire. So there was public awareness of Jesus' death and his empty tomb. I, wanna, I want to look at some scriptures and give you examples of this from the book of Acts. Let's start in Acts chapter 2, Peter's sermon. I just want to hit the highlights. In verse 22, Peter says, Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God did through him in your midst. Notice the phrase, just as you yourselves know. So Peter could stand before thousands of people without anyone pushing back on him and he could declare to them, you know who Jesus is and you know the miracles he did too. God attested to him to you. You know this as a fact. So with that in mind, he goes on. 
this man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of lawless men. So again, he's they're acknowledging Jesus was legit. He did miracles. He was killed by crucifixion. Then in verse 24, but God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. Let me skip down to verse 29, 32. This Jesus God raised up again, to which we are all witnesses. So again, they're saying we saw him, we're witnesses. Verse 33, therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out that which you see and hear. And he ends his sermon around verse 36. I want to jump down there. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. The key phrases in that are he has a crowd here and he's telling them, you all know who Jesus was. You're not denying that. You know, even know the miracles he did. You know he was killed by crucifixion on a cross. How can, and here's the question, how can Peter make claims such as God raised him from the dead? He said it more than once. God raised him from the dead. And at the end of this sermon, thousands of people believe. So here's what's interesting that I want to share with you. My argument is this. They already knew that the tomb was empty. They just did not have an explanation for why it was empty. Well, then here comes Peter and says, you know he was killed on a cross. You know the tomb's empty. Here's the answer. God raised him from the dead, according to the scriptures. God raised him from the dead. Let's look at David. My argument then is that made it really understandable at the end of the sermon. All of a sudden they're like, well, what do we do? How do we repent of this? This is believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. So I'm stressing to you, it was a common story being told in their day, spreading around like wildfire. Hey, do you know what happened in Jerusalem? What, you remember that dude, Jesus? Yeah, the miracle worker teacher guy that they killed on a cross? Yeah, his tomb's empty. Oh my goodness, what happened? Oh, we don't know. We don't know what happened, but the tomb's empty. Well, then here come the apostles and they tell you, I can tell you why the tomb's empty. You've heard of David, right? He said this in the Psalms. You've heard of Isaiah, right? He said this. And then their minds start, okay, yeah, I could see where they were talking about a resurrection. And then he pierces the heart with, God has validated that Jesus is the Messiah. He raised him from the dead, and we are eyewitnesses. And not everyone believed, right? But thousands were like, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Because we were looking for an explanation, and this makes sense. And here you are telling us you're a witness. Another one in Acts chapter 3, when Peter and John go to the temple and they heal the lame man. In verse 13, he says uh, to the crowd, The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. And again, he's going to say his phrase, Whom you delivered and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him, but you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you but put to death the author of life whom God raised from the dead and then this phrase a fact to which we are witnesses again that's another example that the crowd must have already been aware because you don't see them questioning well wait a minute who was Jesus wait a minute you, he died by crucifixion when did that happen wait a minute you're telling me he rose again I didn't know the tomb was empty no they already know he was killed and the tomb's empty Peter is filling in the blanks for them. So he goes on, on the basis of faith in his name, this name Jesus, which has strengthened this man. So then the priests come along, and they don't like this message. They threaten him, tell him to not preach again. Well, then you get to Acts 4, and they're at it again. In Acts 4, verse 1, they were speaking to the people. The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to them, being greatly agitated because they were teaching the people and preaching in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in jail until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the message believed, and the number of men came to be about 5,000. So there's this explosive growth already within the first four chapters of Acts. How can that be if this is a scam? It's a conspiracy. It would have been too easy for these thousands of people to say, wait a minute, you're telling me the tomb was empty. We haven't heard that. No, they're already very much aware that these are facts. He was killed and the tomb's empty. They just don't understand how it happened. So they're coming along and saying to them, 
we are witnesses of what happened. He rose again from the dead. And then you see the priests are annoyed. Why are the priests annoyed and want to throw him in jail? Think about this one too. When I read this, this thought hit me. Pretend you're the religious leaders. You're the priests that don't like the apostles. In fact, you're the ones that wanted Jesus to be killed. And you see Peter and John here in the temple convincing thousands of people, uh, Jesus rose from the dead and you've got to believe in him. And you're really, you don't like that. You're annoyed with that message. Why do you need to go arrest them and throw them in jail and threaten them? When if the story is false, all you have to do is prove them wrong. And it should be super easy to prove them wrong. Because there's too many things for the disciples to have made up that would have been too easy to prove wrong. My point again is this. Even the religious leaders knew they killed him, they sentenced him to death, and they know the tomb is empty three days later. They, I would argue their angle is they don't want to accept the answer. So they're angry, they're agitated, they threaten them, they beat them, they throw them in jail, they kill some of them. So just think about that, and I know that might be a little weird to try to, to see, but to me that was a big light turning on about, well, wait a minute, even in the book of Acts, the method of how the apostles preached they preach to people sort of assuming that they already know the tomb was found empty. And it's as if they're pulling on that common knowledge and trying to fill in the blanks for the people. So the fact that the priests were annoyed, like in Acts 4, says a lot. They're annoyed because they also knew the tomb was empty. They were jealous and angry. The apostles were claiming that they had the answer to why the tomb was empty. Jesus rose again. The apostles' ability to perform miracles in Jesus' name was further evidence that the leaders could not dispute. They're angry because they knew they could not answer back or refute the apostles' claim about the resurrection. So what's the solution? Well, let's throw them in jail and get rid of them. We can't prove them wrong. They're convincing a bunch of people. But I would stress to you, okay, but if this is a sham, it should have been easy to prove wrong. There's too many eyes on this event. So you have in Acts 17.6, Peter, uh, Paul is arrested and the Jews say, these people, these Christians who are turning the world upside down. So again, how can there be this explosive influential growth immediately after Jesus is, is dead and rises again if the resurrection is not true? A final thing from Acts I'll share and we'll, we'll move on and I'm just about done is in Acts chapter 5. I find this very interesting. You may recall another time when Peter and John are arrested. They go before the council, the Sanhedrin. And there's a famous teacher there, Gamaliel, who was a mentor of Paul. And if you recall there, they're wanting to possibly sentence the apostles to death or throw them in jail. And they even say that they can't deny that a miracle has taken place. But they don't want to accept the reason why Paul, Peter said they could do the miracle. Jesus gave them that power and he rose from the dead. So they said, well, let's throw them in jail, let's beat them, maybe let's kill them. What are we going to do with these guys? So let me pick up where some of the trial is happening here. Acts 5, verse 27. When they had brought them, they stood them before the Sanhedrin, and the high priest questioned them, saying, We strictly commanded you not to continue teaching in this name, yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and intend to bring this man's blood on our heads. But Peter and the apostles answered and said, We must obey God rather than men. Again, back to what we said earlier. If this was a lie, there's your chance to save your life. Wait a minute, guys, we were joking. But what does he say? We have to obey God rather than you. We can't deny that we've seen Jesus. You can kill us. We don't care. We know what we saw. Anyways, moving on. Um, then he says, The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you put to death. Again, they're pulling on common knowledge. You guys know what you did. You sentenced them to death. Uh, this one God has exalted to his right hand as a leader and a savior to grant repentance to Israel for the forgiveness of sins. So now they're saying God's raised him again. Verse 32, again the phrase, we are witnesses of these things. So they're not saying they heard the story of Jesus. They're saying we saw him. We saw him again after he was killed. Verse 33, when they heard this, they were furious and intended to kill them. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, respected by the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and gave orders to put the men outside for a short time. So listen to Gamaliel's advice. Men of Israel, be careful what you intend to do with these men. 
For some time ago, Thutis rose up claiming to be somebody. A group of about 400 men joined up with him, but he was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After this, a man named Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and drew away people after him, and he also perished, and all those who were following him were scattered. So he gives two examples of, look guys, we've dealt with this before. We've dealt with people that rose up saying, I'm the Messiah or I'm someone important, you should follow me. But once their leader was killed, their movement died. They were gone. So his advice is this, in the present case, I also say to you, Stay away from these men and leave them alone. For if this plan or action is of men, it will be overthrown. But if it is from God, you will not be able to overthrow them, or you may even be found fighting against God. So his advice is, we're not sure what's up with these guys. Let's just leave them alone. If they're not legit, they'll be like the other two guys. They'll, they'll just disapparate into nothing. But it's possible on the off chance that they're legit and what they're saying is true. Well, if we persecute them, we're actually working against God. And we don't want to be working against God. Verse 40, they followed his advice. They did beat the uh, apostles, commanded them not to speak, but then they let them go. All that to say this. Once again, the apostles are given a chance to deny it, but they can't. They draw on common knowledge of, you know what happened. You know he was killed and the tomb was empty. And their solution then is to listen to Gamaliel, who said, it's actually possible they're right, so let's leave him alone and see what happens. I would stress the argument of, if they knew that Jesus really did not rise from the dead, like they knew it for certain fact, if they knew where he was buried, if they knew they were lying, or why didn't they prove them wrong? Why didn't they go get the body? Or why didn't they? It would have been too easy to prove that they were wrong. But that didn't happen. Uh, you could argue that other groups grow fast as well. Uh, and that's true. But I'm stressing to you the group of Christians were claiming they literally saw Jesus alive after death. That's a big difference. If that was a bogus claim, it should have been too easy to prove them wrong. However, here we are in the year 2021, and Christianity is still, it's still here, right? It is vibrantly growing. If it's so simple, why deny it? So again, I stress to you, if there's all this evidence, why deny it? I'll end on 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I believe Paul tells us why. Verse 18, For the word of the cross, that's the gospel, is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Here's the phrase I want you to hang on to. Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. So it is not a head problem, or uh, yeah, it's not a head problem in my view, it's a heart problem. You could take someone and give them all the evidence in the world, give them 200 more things than what I've shared with you, and they may still look at you and say, that sounds great, but no, it's, I don't believe it. And they'll always have an excuse why. The problem's not with you. The problem's not with your proofs. The problem is their heart. They don't want to believe. Paul says that. The natural man doesn't want to know the things of God, doesn't want God. And Paul said, here, here's the irony of it all. Why doesn't God write a message in the sky? I'm the Lord. I'm Yahweh. I'm here. Believe in me. Why doesn't Jesus still appear to people all over today? Or we could go on and on about God. Why don't you do this or that? It would make everyone believe in you. Paul's actual answer is he doesn't want to. He doesn't want to as a form of uh, indictment on human sinfulness because as humans, we're prone to think, well, we can do it ourselves. We don't need God. We have science. We have logic. We have philosophy. We have all these things to where we can master the world and we don't need God. Paul says, well, to them, of course, the gospel message is foolish because they think they're wise in their own eyes and they don't want to even see God. So God is sort of in his own pleasure said, well, you know what? Have it your way. 
I'm going to save people that the world thinks are fools, uneducated, ignorant, you know, backward thinking people. And you hear that today, right? Like, oh, you're a Christian, like you believe in fairy tales. Well, fairy tale to you, but it's the wisdom of God. I mean, take your pick. So that's, I want to end on that and I just open it up if y'all have any questions. Thank you for watching this. We hope it's been helpful to you. If it has, please consider liking and sharing the video and subscribing to our channel. Join us next time as we begin to examine, is the Bible true?